Well, I want to welcome you all to the green room. It is a, a good day for an indoor activity. <laughs> yeah. I want to thank Rowena Aldridge for being here today. And uh, she has a very interesting message uh, to share with you. And, and, and I tell you, I, and I love her approach about uh, where she, uh, you know, gives you some background on you know where she comes from and, and and really each of our unique experience is really what makes us who we are so i'm glad she takes the time to kind of cover some of that because it uh it personalizes uh, what she's going to tell you afterwards a lot and it helps you understand that this is not something that uh, that you have to have some degree to do you you can all you have to have is the want to because most have the uh really a space, it's just a matter of looking for it and availing yourself to it. So without further ado, are we not? Thank you. Oh, am I on? I am. So, uh, welcome. Thank you for coming today. I am a newly certified educator for the Square Foot Gardening Foundation. Which I, and uh, so I'm here today to tell you about the Square Foot Gardening Method specifically, but also I want to share with you a little bit at the start of how I came to be a Square Foot Gardener in the hopes that that will encourage you. Oh, you made it. Great. Well, great about that. In the hopes that uh, my story about how I got here will encourage you in the knowledge that really anybody can do it. Uh, so I have put together a little uh, presentation about that. I um, did not start out in any way domestic. I started out from a young age um, as a ballerina. I was trained professionally in a, in a boarding school where I lived from third grade on and became a professional dancer in my teens. Um, I don't have a lot of pictures of this, but there you can see. I think I was 12 there. Uh, traveled the world, uh, lived in hotels, lived in cities. Uh, I danced uh, for, this is Anna Marie Holmes uh, being Cinderella there. I was the fairy godmother. She was the artistic director for the Boston Ballet. And then this is a festival ballet that I danced for for a number of years. Um, my point being that uh, I was in cities and I was on the road traveling. In fact, I put together my own cabaret show that I took on the road for about six years. That's the bag, the dance bag with shoes and what have you. I bought that bag when I was in Russia for that one trip. Um, didn't do anything with gardening for years, years and years. One day, when I was on tour and came through Nashville, actually, with the company, I met a man at the theater who was working there that I really liked, and he invited me out to dinner, and uh, so I left my tour after that. I thought, this, is, this guy's really cool. <laughs> and a few years later, we married. But uh, we lived downtown at that time. We lived across the street from the Capitol, a couple of blocks from TPAC, which is where we were working. And I danced with a couple of local companies and ran my own dance company. Did a lot of modern dancing at the time, but again, I was not doing, I was in the theater uh, working pretty much all the time. Uh, but I wanted to eventually transition off stage, and I could sew at the time. Uh, well, can't still. <laughs> but I, uh, so I decided whoops, to use those skills to become um, a costumer. Uh, so I ended up working in costume departments around town, one of them being uh, Tennessee Repertory Theater, where I created costumes for oh, dozens of shows. The, the cowgirl costumes you see out here on the mannequins were actually for Mandy Barnett for uh, when she did Patsy Cline's show. Uh, and uh, so did that for several years and then we had our little girl Ella. And uh, because uh, of the unique situation of being in theater, and at that time I was at Vanderbilt, by then I was working for the Vanderbilt Opera, creating their costumes. Ella came to, to work with me every day. Uh, there she is with the cast of uh, Tartuffe. I created costumes for seven years for them, did uh, the design and the build, uh, everything from this is a, a Renaissance show all the way up to hippie period and everything in between. Ella was with me the whole time. And my husband actually worked there at the time. This is what I was telling you guys earlier. He uh, and I worked together at the uh, Vanderbilt School of Music. So eventually it was time for her to start school. And we knew all along that we were probably going to homeschool, and of course, by the time we got to it, we committed. And uh, at that time, after 40 years of being in the performing arts, from my childhood up until that time, uh, after all that time, I came home to, to live at, and to work at home with her. 
So we're now down to one income. And at this point, not only did we need me to learn to do all those domestic things that I never learned to do, but I, want, I wanted to do them. I had an opportunity, I had time, and that's when I began gardening. Anyway, so this was our first day of homeschool. And integrated into our homeschool became all the domestic things that I was learning, including gardening. And uh, so I had, all, years ago, while on the road, I had bought this book. This is a um, Mel Bartholomew's original square foot gardening. Actually, I don't think this is the first edition. I think this is the second. But uh, second edition just had more pictures and stuff in it. This is uh, a book I carried on, on the road with me all over the place thinking about uh, what I would do when I had a home and a, and a garden. And so I was inspired by that and started doing some research on the Internet and found a website called Little House in the Suburbs which is uh, linked right here. This woman lives actually in Jackson, Tennessee. And she, uh, so she's in our zone. And she has all kinds of garden plans available. So I found her site, Free Garden Plan, Beginner Garden in a Day. And it's based on square, square foot gardening. And I'm like, I can do that. So um, unlike what I was inclined to do my whole life, which was to ignore instructions, <laughs> I decided I didn't know a thing about this, so I better follow instructions. And I did exactly what she said. I followed the plan that she had written, built the book garden exactly as she specified, in boxes, put the soil in. At that time, I planted some things in, uh, in uh, seed and some in um, transplants. And I didn't point this out earlier, but the areas that are blank right now have seed in them. So this was the beginner garden, which I called my Italian garden because it has things in it. I thought, oh, I'm going to make sauces and things like that. And I did. And then she had a squash garden, which I briefly called my squashed garden because about an hour after this picture was taken, my dog trampled it. And uh, oh, I'm actually, it looks like she may have gotten to it partly there, but things survived. Uh, and uh, so these pictures that I just showed you, they were taken on the very first day, immediately after planting. And this is, these are the two garden beds here. That's all I had. This is week two. And you can see already week two, this, all this area here where there were seeds, this is bush beans. You can barely see some squash growing here. This is the one and only pumpkin seed I planted. But it came up. This is important. Let's see in just a minute. Oh, I should go back. Let me go back. I put, uh, I forgot to say this earlier. Mm -hmm. I had to label, I had to put a tag, because I was so new at gardening, I had no idea what anything looked like by its leaves, and so I needed to know what was coming up. So there's week three. Just in three weeks already, there's the, that pumpkin, there's the squash, things are, are growing. Mm -hmm. Week four, we already have little tiny tomatoes and squash blossoms. Look at this. Sunflowers are starting to come up. And in that week, Ella harvested her first radishes. Oh, <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. Those radishes are now her pride and joy. And as, as, as just this morning, we harvested the very first one. It was tiny, but uh, no one will ever come to our house from now until the radishes are gone without leaving with one. <laughs> so this is week five. And we, we started to talk about how the garden was holding hands because they were starting to branch out. And th at this point, the garden, I quit taking weekly pictures because it became just a lot to do. But we started harvesting and cooking out of our own garden. Remy, I don't know if you're familiar with the Ratatouille movie, Remy. This is his Ratatouille recipe where it's sliced instead of chopped and uh, frittatas. And, out of this, Ella learned to eat things that she might not have even considered food in the past at the grocery store. <laughs> I, and so did I. I have to say, a squash blossom never occurred to me until somebody said, oh, you can fry those. And, you know, I'll, I'll fry anything and eat that. <laughs> so th at, this was later that summer. That's the one and only pumpkin seed I planted, taking over. <laughs> this, and, Bear in mind that there's only eight inches of, of uh, material in that box. It's not, I didn't dig down at all, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. But out of that, we harvested these pumpkins and more. 
the orange one got carved for Halloween, and the green one got turned into pumpkin pie. Thanks. So that's our first year harvest. I recorded it in pounds. I weighed it as it came in. Seven pounds of beans, 19 pounds of tomatoes, 14 pounds of peppers, 6 pounds of radishes, 18 pounds of yellow squash, 17 pounds of zucchini. Now I know a lot of people say, oh, that's too much, but I have never in my life had too much zucchini. And uh, one thing we do with it, by the way, if you ever find yourself in a position of having too much, uh, I slice it and I dehydrate it. And sometimes I'll sprinkle seasonings on it before I dehydrate, and we eat that like chips. Uh, Ten pounds of cucumbers. Oh, also dehydrating is a way to store a lot of food in a very small place. Uh, nine pumpkins, two braids of onions, squash blossoms, uh, basil and dill, Swiss chard daily, which was delicious. I was so surprised. Marigolds on our table, and we saved our seeds. So I felt very successful with those two boxes. And the next year, oh, I canned. I learned to can. I was so proud. Uh, that's basil jelly, the green stuff. And these are mangoes, which obviously I did not grow those. But uh, you can see I, I, I did do it. <laughs> so we added to our gardens the next year. We made two more boxes. And this became Ella's box, which we uh, she grew anything she wanted. And she wanted to grow a three sisters garden like the Indians did. So she's preparing that there. This garden has extra little boxes set into it because I wanted to grow root vegetables like um, carrots. I had some sweet potatoes to grow here. And in the back, I had grown potatoes. And traditionally, those are hilled up as they grow. Rather than doing that, I just added more boxes and filled them as they went. So this way, it makes it also portable. You can uh, rotate your gardens pretty easily when you do that. So there they are. Uh, they, the sweet potatoes weren't in yet, but everything else was at this point. The, the carrots had been planted and the, and the regular potatoes. So that's the second year harvest. 27 pounds of russet potatoes in, the, in the, the back of that box. 27 pounds, that's a lot. 15 pounds of sweet potatoes. Only 12 carrots, but we only planted a few. So I think we planted 16 and a few didn't come up. 23 ears of corn in Ella's little garden. Nine pounds of green beans. Four pounds of dry beans, which we kept over the winter. And eight. 22 pounds of tomatoes, uh, part of which I froze, some I dried, some I canned. 12 pounds of peppers, 7 pounds of radishes, 43 pounds of squash. <laughs> yeah, we did give some of that away. <laughs> but we still dehydrated and froze some things. 5 watermelons, uh, 9 pounds of cucumbers, 7 pumpkins, 2 braids of onions. But also, the squash blossoms and the basil and the dill and the marigolds and salad greens, which we had both spring and fall, every day a fresh salad out of the garden for almost two months in the spring and two in the fall. So um, I show this picture because this is a watermelon and that's a sweet potato. And people, yeah, so the question is which is which, which right. is big and which is small. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This is uh, one of the sweet potatoes we dug out at the end of the season. It's, you can see it's about the size of a ham hock. It's 12 inches. <laughs> it weighed pounds. I can't remember how many pounds, like three or four pounds. That's the end of season greens in my refrigerator. That's just, that's the, we had to take a middle shelf out here <laughs> to get them all in. Wow. Do you have them on ice? What is that? No, they were just wet. That's the refrigerator. There's the vegetables. No, the, 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 the gray in the middle. The, the, the gray? gray. Yeah. That's broccoli. That's a head of broccoli. Oh, 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 oh really? Yeah. yeah this, this is just a few head, few things. That's one head of lettuce, one broccoli. That's some uh, mustard. This is pulling one of the last carrots out of that box. Yeah. This uh, box was already done. That one was, I'll tell you about in just a moment. This one, you can see some, a few sweet potato vines. The marigold was in with the potatoes to protect it, protect the potatoes from the bugs that like them, like, like to eat them. So extending the season. I wanted to learn to grow longer than just the summer. So this is my blog called Romesticity. I'm showing you this post because of the date. It's November the 2nd last year. This is one of the benefits of learning to extend your season with some of the techniques I'll show you. I covered the gardens with hoops and plastic. And uh, they say that every layer of plastic you put on, every six mil layer, 
adds a zone to where you live. So we're in zone six, this will make it zone five, you know, further south, our season's longer. So in November, <coughs> there's a little bit more. I still had tomatoes inside there. Peppers, baby peppers still growing. That's our fourth harvest of black beans right there. Uh, marigolds that we put on the table for Thanksgiving. We actually harvested on Thanksgiving Day for a fresh meal to go with them. So, yeah. Uh, and that's just from, you can see those gardens there, extending the season in those gardens. Now, are those actually plastic, or is that um, like the lightweight rug covers? No, it's plastic. Yeah. Uh, and I'll, go sh I'll show you some of that in a, in a bit from that same blog. Oops. All right, so the second season, I had enough red tomatoes to can to make sauce all winter long. I froze enough beans, squash, and peppers for most of our winter. I dehydrated 10 pounds of potatoes, dehydrated watermelon for Christmas treats. Instead of candy, I dehydrated chunks of watermelon, and when they get small and, and dry like that, they get really sweet, and so that was our, our Christmas treat. Uh, we froze green tomatoes so that Mama could have fried green tomatoes <laughs> on winter, more basil jelly, and we stored seeds. Uh, I think I, my mind is telling me we had other things in the freezer, but I can't recall what they were. So, I did some urban foraging, and I put this here because I wanted you to see, out of what you saw there in the urban foraging, I provided 70% of all our vegetables, fruits, nuts, jams, jellies, sauces, pies, and treats for the past 12 months, or for, uh, for the 12-month season, out of four gardens and my art urban foraging, which someone was asking about earlier. That's basically going out wherever you can and finding things like nuts and, you know, uh, Fruits that you can pick, that sort of thing. Like in the woods? Service berry, yeah. Service berry, yeah. Um, well, I got the nuts out of a, a metro park, out of under a tree where my homeschool group meets. Uh, the peaches were on a tree that a neighbor had, and he said, just come over and pick all you want. I picked 120-some pounds of peaches off his tree. Wow. Fell out in the process, but um, fell out of the tree. <laughs> uh, canned and uh, what have you with those. Uh, this was a tremendous help to us given the fact that I wasn't working anymore, um, we were still able to manage on one income. So this is getting the gardens ready for spring. So that, what you see in the back, the covered gardens, that is plastic. Now, you can use the row cover that you're talking about, the tobacco cloth, but uh, it, over the winter, that is not enough protection. Uh, this actually warms it up inside. When the direct sunlight hits it, I wish I had a picture. I've got one at home. Shoot. I'll email you all. Wow. Um, you here's a picture. It? Pardon me? I, I've never heard of it or seen the it. plastic? Where you get it, yeah. That came from uh, uh, one of the big box hardware stores in the cleaning department. It's just six millimeter oh, okay. plastic. Yeah. But uh, I've got pictures of the thermometer in there. It'll get over 100 if you're not careful, if they get direct sunlight on it. Um, so we've ex expanded the gardens. We have more gardens now than, we, than these boxes. But uh, this was the spring, this year. Um, what you see here, this is a. It's either a cabbage or a cauliflower. It's hard to tell at that point. This is peas. There's some um, spinach at the bottom. Just a few weeks later, the same plants growing. Um, we actually pulled radishes this morning. Well, we're going to have peas tomorrow. We're going to have uh, spinach and things like that tonight. Is that soil conditioner on the top? No, that's just some mulch. What kind of mulch? Uh, pine? It's like pine mulch. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I just bought a bag of mulch. Uh, and that's uh, just a pretty picture. But, <laughs> but uh, I had to get up on the ladder. I don't know if you can see how high I am from looking at the gardens below to get that picture. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, the reason I'm telling you all of this is I wanted to demonstrate that immediate success is really very possible following some very basic principles of square foot gardening, which are based on centuries of knowledge that the French used before. They called it intensive gardening. Uh, some people have called it biodynamic gardening. But essentially, it is um, a way to garden at, in the home garden rather than an agricultural setting. Because uh, our gardening knowledge that we grow up with as far as you know, making rows and hoeing out the weeds and all that is based on really agricultural practices for big farming where they have to get huge machines down through the farm so they have to leave room for those tires to go through and they have to be able to get all of the stuff efficiently processed by the machine. We're not doing that at home. 
Not to even mention the fact that who here really needs 30 cabbages to come to harvest all at once? That is, that, I mean, it's absurd unless you're going to process them in some way, which is great. Part sauerkraut. I tried that. I'm not good at that yet, but I'm working on it. Uh, but any, at any rate, well, what I would like to show you now that I've introduced how I got here is how it's done, at least how I've done it. And it's based on the principles both in the old book and in, Mel has written another book that have uh, a few of the enhancements like the, uh, the um, covers, the, the hoop houses, just called All New Square Foot Gardening. Yeah. The old one was just Square Foot Gardening. Uh, and there's a website, squarefootgardening.org. But um, anyway, so I want to show you now that, that we're here exactly how it works. And I'm going to start with just the basic idea of the four-foot square garden, which uh, is where you would start if you want to just get, get your feet wet. This actually is a four-foot square size, which is, it seems small to most people, but I'm going to show you in a moment just how, how that works. One of the reasons that Mel chose this size is that um, if you can walk all the way around the box, you can easily reach to the center of this box without stepping on any of your harvest, without damaging your crops, without smooshing your dirt, uh, which is not really dirt exactly, but uh, at any rate, uh, it's easy to, to access all of the garden without damaging any other parts of it. Now, if you were to have a garden, say, up against a wall, you wouldn't want it four feet deep because you wouldn't be able to reach the back of it. So in that case, you'd make it two feet deep, or even one foot if you want. Uh, but the idea being that you are going to create a garden that you can always access without stepping on any of it. And the way that we create these gardens is to build up rather than digging down. One of the best reasons to do that is because unless you have been on your property for a number of years, and I couldn't tell you exactly how many years it is because it would depend on what's happened there, you don't know what's been sprayed on your property or what has... Uh, you know, flown in on the wind onto your property. You may not know what's in your dirt. We ourselves found asbestos shingles in our ground, in our garden area, the intended garden area, it's not the garden area now, just 18 inches down. Uh, left there by homeowners that had uh, done a renovation instead of disposing of it appropriately, they buried it. Which for, you know, now that I think about it, that may be what you do with it, but not in the garden. <laughs> So at any rate, they, they, if you don't deal with your existing soil, you don't have to worry about your existing soil, what's in it. But another reason is when you build up, you can control exactly what your medium is that you're growing in. And the medium that Mel recommends is a third compost, blended compost, which I'll talk about in a moment, a third vermiculite, and a third peat moss. Now, the... the uh, from the uh, compost that he recommends, blended, means that if you're going out to buy compost, you want to buy as many different brands as possible, at least five different if you can. And the reason is because most commercial compost is a byproduct of some industry. So it's not going to have a wide range of materials in it. It may, like we were talking about earlier, when you see cow manure, maybe it has cow manure in it. Maybe. Uh, and it might have a little bit. But even if it is pure cow manure that's been composted, all that's in there is what the cow ate, which is either grass or grain or both. That's fine, but you know there's no calcium in that. Uh, there's no phosphorus in that. So you want to get other types that blend it all together. Eventually, you're, what you want is to have your own compost bin going. Because that way, you know everything that's in your kitchen and in your yard and all the newspapers that come in and all that all goes together, you've got a rich, varied compost. You really don't even have to test it. It's probably got everything that you need right there. The vermiculite is there for two reasons. It keeps the soil loose and makes it workable, but also the way it is created, it holds water. Vermiculite is a rock, a mica rock that is mined, and it's heated up till it explodes, and that exploding like popcorn gives it a lot of pores and makes it absorb water to hold more water in your garden so you don't have to water as often. The peat moss is there to lighten the soil as well, or 
Faith Nursery now has a mix that they have put together where in place of the peat, they are using um, worm castings, which is the gold standard in plant food. And uh, you, when you have that, your plants pretty much have everything they need. So that's, a, that's also a possibility you can buy pre-mixed, all ready to go. Uh, in the third world, I wish I had mentioned this earlier, where they can't get uh, all those other ingredients, we teach straight compost because it's, that's the food right there. So there's no technically any soil there, but everything the plant needs to grow is there. And that's why you can grow a sunflower this big in what amounts to, uh, I have, my boxes are eight inches, but you know, there's, it shrank a little bit, so maybe seven, six inches of uh, material to grow in. Uh, so you have your box and you have it filled and you have, oh, and on the ground, by the way, someone had asked this earlier. When you put your box on the ground, some people like to use a weed barrier. I instead use a layer of leaves, because I have them in the yard, and I, a layer of newspaper or brown paper or cardboard, whatever, just to keep a layer, because when you put that weed barrier there, the earth and your garden do not interact anymore. So the worms can't come up and your roots can't go down. Uh, you can certainly do that if you so choose, and I would not judge that. I just have this earthworm thing, so I, you know, I like my earthworms to come up. But at any rate, now you have a box to plant, and a lot of people look at it and think, okay, now what do I put where? The first thing you do is figure out what you want to eat and how much of it you want to eat. So if you want those 30 cabbages, by all means, plant them. Plant as many as you want, but... Uh, you, you're not, you don't have to. Where's my first? For example, what you do after you get that to help give you a boundary and kind of structure your garden, we recommend you put on a grid. So now you're literally looking at square feet of garden. And you're dealing only with a square at a time. Right. Oops, is that me? Now some people use... Uh, wood strips like molding what have you directly to the garden i've done that in mine um i have some stri string uh, the idea being that now you have a place that you know where everything goes the only garden we don't do this to is ella's because she likes to plant in circles so <laughs> <laughs> it's her garden i'll just let her have it how she wants but at any rate then i make it for myself i make a chart and uh, i have three charts spring summer fall. I'm going to make a winter one this year. And so, for example, I, I decide I might want three heads of broccoli between now and, you know, when, when I planted this, I, would, I said between now and Easter. Uh, when you plant three heads of broccoli, you actually get six or seven because you cut the main head off and then you get a little bit more later growing up. But anyway, any rate, now you can start planting according to what your plants really need and not according to how the farmer down the road does it. And by that I mean, when you look at the package, you know it'll say, um, sprinkle it, you know, all along your row. And then when you get seedlings, you come back and thin it out. And uh, uh, for me, part of the problem with that is um, recognizing what was a seedling that I grew and what was a weed. <laughs> rather than do that, though, rather than double working, you just plant what you need. If the plant spacing is 12 inches, you put one seed or one transplant in the square. That's it. You're done. That square's planted. This would be for broccoli, anything big, tomatoes, um, peppers, cabbage, that sort of thing. If the plant is a little bit smaller, like Swiss chard or... Uh, I'm having trouble thinking of something that's smaller than that, but uh, anyway. Carrots go actually closer. You would just plant one in each of the quadrants of the block, and you're done. And you know, if you wanted to plant two seeds there, you could. That's cool. Um, this is bush beans, is the spacing I use for bush beans. I know that it seems like very close to most people, but you know, I got four harvests out of the bush beans planted this close. So it's just nine planted together. You can draw little lines, which is what I have done sometimes in the garden with my fingers, and then poke the holes. Kids like to poke the holes. This is my spacing for carrots. 16 in a block. And I just poke the holes and drop the seeds in. So you can decide based on examining your family's eating habits. I mean, you think back, how many heads of broccoli did I buy in the past two months? That's a good place to start in knowing how much you want to grow. The 
the other great thing about this is when you look at your garden each day and you go out and obsessively stand over it and will your plants to sprout. If you see anything in the square you planted with this that is not here, anything else is a weed, a seed that blew in or managed to come up. Pluck it out, you're done. Uh, this was very helpful to me when I was first learning what does a cabbage seed look like, I mean a cabbage leaf look like, what does a tomato leaf look like. Once that's done, you are basically doing maintenance now. You're waiting for things to come up. You will water, you know, only, you know where your plants are, so you can put the water right on the plant, right at its base. You don't have to water the whole thing and scatter your water all over the garden, although I will be honest, when it's hot, I do soak the whole box because I feel like somehow when I put the water at the base of the tomato plant, the, the dry parts kind of suck it out. And so you have that, and then you just reap the harvest, basically. <laughs>